Okay, I'm going to start it as I promised all of you. Uh, I would do a part two of this week's uh, BISS 4403. And last night we covered uh, Lunch's database five, which didn't have a whole lot of coding in it. It was really more about understanding the data dictionary. And I wanted to stop and review some concepts we've been covering. Uh, about the data warehouse and data extraction processes, et cetera. So it really wasn't the typical kind of night that we've become accustomed to here of late, where we've run a lot of code and that code's gotten a little more complex as we go along. But we are back to that point now. And as I promised you, I'm gonna do 60 to maybe 75 minutes or so. And we're gonna cover chapter six uh, out of the uh, Patrick text. So uh, I want to take a, a second here and go back and I've got the announcements up here, the announcements I have, the, the, um, the, the screencast for um, BISS 4403, part one of two. This is of course part two of two. Well, as usual, we're gonna, you're going to start with the Patrick materials and you'll download them. Okay, and as we talked about, once you download them, you're gonna find three, you download them to your desktop, and here's what you're gonna find. Down at the test desktop, you open it up, and you're gonna find the data warehouse, that's this access file called SQL Fund 2007, and then you're gonna find the code for each of the specific chapters, and then you'll find some revisions, some errata to the, uh, or errors that he has in the code. So let's go ahead and start. Now, I already have, um, I already have SQL Fund 2007 out on the desktop, and I had named it uh, LD5. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and uh, I'm going to copy this, and I'm going to paste it to my desktop. Okay, and I'm gonna call it SQL7 LD7 Armin Keith. So when I'm finished, I can upload it. Got it? Now again, we're using the same file. This is again, this data warehouse concept we've talked about. So let's go ahead and open this back up. Now we'll go through some of these security. Not a big deal, and then we'll enable the content. And there are our tables. Now we have all access objects. We'll move the shutter bar over a little bit. Now we get some of this stuff. And then we'll move it over just a bit. Now we've got all the objects, and we can, of course, just choose the tables. Or if we want, we can look at the queries which is the second type of object. We've talked, spoke about this many times, okay? And then there are the forms. And then we also get a report, all right? So we're gonna be doing some work. And so we're gonna go ahead and just go back to the tables, okay? Now, chapter six talks about creating your own tables. And uh, this, we're going to learn, we're going to see how we can write code to create a table. But in most commercial products today, uh, database administrators generate their own tables um, using a graphic user interface, much like is available through um, in Access. Because as I said before, Access is kind of a model or the mother of all databases. So we're gonna go over to page um, 210, which gives you an outline of the chapter. You can see the three key parts of that, creating chapters, changing tables, and tables with duplicate rows, and, and, and how to handle the, the problem of duplicate rows. Well, I'm gonna diminish the SQL here for a minute, and I'm gonna open up the Patrick materials that file, and I'm gonna open up that zip code that has all the code for each chapter, 
and I'm gonna open up the code for chapter six, okay? And so I'm ready to do my work. And we're gonna start with, we're gonna start by creating a table. And this is over on page 212, okay? Now, we're, we're gonna create a table and let's look for a moment just at at, at the at, at the words. Let's look at let's put some English or human speak to this. We're going to create a table called sectional 601 underscore foods. That's the name of the table. Then we're going to have the following fields with the with the following types of data in them. Menu item, supplier ID, product code, description, price, and then price increase. Now, when we run this table, there won't be any data in it because we're just creating an empty table. How would we populate this table? As we spoke about last night, the easiest and the, the best way would be to create a form that corresponds to it. So we're gonna create this table so we're just gonna simply uh, copy all the code here. And remember, at the end of a, of a query, that we always, it always ends with a semicolon, okay? So I'm gonna control C, and I'm gonna come back in here to the database. I'm gonna click Create, Table Design, pardon me. I'm gonna click Create, Query Design, I'm sorry. And we'll close and we're going to go to the SQL view. All right. And we'll put in the code and we're going to run it. Okay. And all right, we've run our table. And now let's look at the data set. And, we'll, and we're going to save this as, I'm going to save this as task 6-1. Now we've created a table, okay, but there are no data in the table. So let's go down and find that, that table, and we can do it pretty easily. And I'm going to close this query. Well, we'll leave it open here for a minute. I'm going to search for that. I'm going to search, go back up here and look at the table. Section 0601. Okay. And there we are. Section, section, section 0601 underscore foods. My apologies. And we're going to open up, and guess what? It's an empty table. Why is it empty? Simple. We haven't populated the table. As we spoke about before, the best way to, to populate a table is to create a form. So we're going to do that, and we're going to use the graphic user interface to create a form. As I showed you last night, even like if you go to a shop or look for stuff at Amazon, or you enter your password and username, your password, or you go buy something online, or you register at a website, you're populating a table via a form. So we're gonna create a form for this table, so if we would choose to populate it, we can do so far easier than just simply typing data into the, in, into the uh, data sheet. So I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm going to close this. Well, let's go back for a second. Let's check this, make sure of our work. So we'll go to the design view. And do we have a field there, a menu item? It's a number. Yeah, it's, it's a menu item is a byte, so it saves it as a number. Uh, we have a supplier ID. Yes, we have the supplier ID. That's variable characters. That's what this means right here is variable characters. I'll put up where we can all see it. Three characters. 
The product code is a variable character. That can mean it can be a, uh, a special character, a space, uh, it can be a number, it can be a letter, it can be an exclamation point. That's why we use that bar char or variable character. Uh, that's what that means. Same thing with the description. And we say we have 20 spaces uh, allocated to it. Price is going to be uh, in the format of money. So that data will be formatted money. Just like in Excel, you can format numbers in different ways. Same story here. We just use some code to do it. And then, the, and then any price increase is money. There's no data in it, but that's okay. We are interested in creating the table. Okay. So now we're going to create a form. And this will be a pretty simple, pretty simple process. But let's go ahead and, and close everything. And we're going to click Create okay, on the Create tab. And we're going to come over and we're going to use Find More Forms. And we're going to click More Forms. And we're going to click create my favorite type of form. And it's called a, it's called a split form. And you'll see what I'm talking about. So we're going to create a split form. Okay. And we'd been working in 0601 Foods. And so here's the form. Now, as I shared with you last night, if you want, you can go into the design view for this form and you can customize it however you wish. The reason I like this form is quite simple. It allows me to see changes in the table that occur as I make changes in the form. Okay? So, in that case, you know, hey, we're in good shape. Now, I'm going to close this form off, and I'm now, and I'm going to save it as task uh, six dash one a form, which says I created a form. Okay, no big deal there. So now we've created a table, and now we've created a form to populate the table. Now are there, there are some other ways that we can populate a table. We can export data into it. We can append data to it. Those are, are tricky processes. Typically, what we'll do if we have, say, an Excel file that has all the data we want in it, we'll just simply make sure that the Excel file has the same columns in it that we would want in our table. We'll import the uh, Excel sheet into Access, and away we go. So we're going to call this uh, task six one a form. And we've done that. Now I want to go back over here to the foods because there's a couple of things I want to do with this new table that we've created. And let's open it in design view. First of all, you're going to notice that we don't have a primary key. And you know, when we talked about this, the primary key is what allows us to make sure that every record in a table is unique. Because if we don't have a unique set of records, that's when problems occur. That's when we say that the table is not what we use the term normalized, okay? And you can get anomalies of data. You don't want duplicates. Most of the time that creates problems for you, especially if you're running financial data and you have duplicate data, there's no sense in it. So I'm going to do something here. I'm gonna take this, uh, this menu item, and I'm going to make it a primary key, and it's simple. I'm going to here, and boom, it's a primary key. And I'm going to go up to the data sheet view, and we'll save the table. All right, and now I have a table that has a primary key. And let's go back down to the design view of this table. 
And notice here that it's indexed, yes, and no duplicates. If we have, you say, well, okay, but Dr. Herman, what if we have like um, five different types of bread? Okay, well, I'd have a, an ID for each type of bread. Uh, you want to make certain that each row, each record is unique. So that's why you'll have these dimension tables where you identify clearly every single type that you have, okay? Well, we've done that so far, so we've created a table, we've modified it to make sure that it has a primary key, all right? Um, we've generated, we've created a form uh, where we can input data, we can take data and input it into the table, so far, so good. So we're gonna close this off, We'll save it and then we're going to close it. And we're ready to move on. Okay. Now, you'll want to pay some attention over there to page 212 and 213 where they talk about data types. Okay. And where we talk about internal names for elements versus external names or, 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 or synonyms, and they talk about the engines, that, i.e. the programming software that underlies access types of Microsoft, access types of products versus Oracle types of processes. And you'll see over on page 214, the main Oracle and access data types. You don't need to memorize this <laughs> unless you've worked with databases for years. Uh, as a force of habit, you're, there's a point. But the, the, the table there on page 214 and 215 does help you understand, okay, uh, what we call, what, what they do for us in terms of the different types, data types. Now the computer science students have a course called data structures where they do nothing but focus on everything in this table. And why would I use a certain type of data in a certain database, et cetera? And that's really for the database management program, and course, and really for computer scientists. We can have some input if we're familiar with these to ensure that we can get results that are meaningful, okay? Um, if we have, if we're working with currency, for example, we want the data when they're displayed to show up as currency so that everybody understands we're talking about money. Um, the formatting is one of those where it becomes such, it's, it, it's, so, it, it's so contextually driven that you just have to understand there are different ways to format and display data, especially numeric data. Uh, just like we showed you with the input mask last night, uh, we're working with phone numbers. Okay. so. We're gonna go over here and then page 217, the, the authors are gonna start to, they give us some information about text data types, okay? And they give us a long, long, long set of, a, a set of um, code there from or, using Oracle SQL, and that's over on page 219. And then over on page 220, we're given a whole series of, we're given a whole series of um, queries in which we're inserting data into uh, a table. So let's look at that. And that's page uh, over in 220. And then in the code, it should be uh, 6.3. So we'll come over here and here it is. Now, let's talk about this for a minute, what we're seeing here, what we're gonna do. We're gonna create a table. We're gonna call it section 0603 underscore text underscore data types. Uh, we're gonna have a, a row, and that'll be a row ID. It'll be, uh, we'll have variable characters in it. Um, 
And then we're going to have a variable length string, which is a variable character, and then a fixed length string, which is a character that's three spaces, and then a long string, which is for a which is for a memo. And we're going to see uh, the result table. And it's going to be over there on the bottom of page 321. So let's copy this. Okay. And we'll click create and we'll come over here to Corey Design. We'll close off the table selection menu. Boom, because we're writing an original code and we're going to create our table. And here we go. Now I want you to notice something for just a moment. Okay. When we ran the query and we did create table, notice that the data definition here in the design aspect is hot, it's dark. It says you've just executed a type of query that involves data definition. And we define data by naming it and then by identifying what type it is. Here's an example. There's a place called Mars. It is a planet. That's all that's going on here, okay? All that's all it's all that's going on. So we have that, we, we've run that, and we're gonna save this as task six dash three. Okay. And the result set is at the bottom of page 221. So let's go over and see if we can find our text data types table. And there it is. And let's open that jewel up and see what we got. Okay, and well, I want to apologize for a second. 221 shows us the access result table once we've run all of those insert queries that are listed there at the bottom of page 220 and then at the top of page 221. I'm not going to put you through that, okay? That's about 10 or 12 different queries. There just really is no point in that. It's important for you to understand what's what's going on there. And I, we'll take the one that's in the middle of page 220. We'll just look at one of them. We'll, I'll show you what we're talking about again. Once you understand, there's just really, you know, un, unless you need to run one, here's the insert statement. Okay. And into, uh, let's just go ahead and what we're going to do this one, this one insert. All right. So let me do this for a sec. Go back over to my annotation. Get the trusty eraser, get rid of that. Okay. Now, here we are. Now we're ready. And we're going to close this table off. And we can close that off. We've done it. We've saved it, and now we'll close it. And we're going to click Create. We're going to go to query design. And we're going to insert this data into this new table we created. Now remember, as I told you, if you want to populate a table, using a form to populate it is far easier or Many, most of the time, once you're dealing with an established database and it's been operational for a long time, what you're typically doing, typically you'll just be adding new records. You won't be creating a whole new table, okay? That's just not gonna be the case. So I've got the, I'm gonna go ahead and, and, and paste in the code, I'm gonna run it. 
and it says you're about to append one row. We're appending some a row to the table. And now I want you to notice something, okay? As I've said before, the software, the reason that Access is the mother of all commercial databases is simple. It's designed to give you feedback about what you did. That's what makes it such a powerful tool is it has the ability for you to interact for it to interact with you, for you to see, hey, I just did an append query. How do you know? Well, I can see the icon, okay? All righty. Now, I'm going to call this, I'm going to save this as task six, three, a. Okay. And let's look at our table and let's see what it looks like. And there it is. Now, if you ran all of the queries that are at the bottom of page 220 and at the top of page 221, you'd populate that table accordingly. Okay, um, I think once you've run an insert, uh, once you've run an insert um, query, I, I think you pretty much got it, okay? So, you're in good shape as far as that goes. It, the author just, add some more things to it. But again, the best way is either to, if is to create a table using the graphic user interface or uh, using, doing that, pardon me. The best way to add data to a table as far as I'm concerned is by using a form in which the end user has supplied you data. They may have supplied you data that your folks put into the form that populate the table, or you may have an, you may have an, inter, an electronic interface where they come to your website uh, and they enter their data, and then that goes into the table, okay? So we've made some progress here as far as populating tables. Now, the, The date and time data types are, they're just as, in, in access, they're just as finicky as they can be, all right? And all I can, all I can tell you is that the, you just have to be careful, and, but more importantly, you just have to be thankful <laughs> you're not, you're not going to be a data, database administrator who has to wrestle with this every single day of the week. You're going to hear people talk about unsupervised, un, um, unstructured data. What they mean are data that don't fit easily into a table, and they and they're and and we're not quite sure what a date, what data type they truly are. So we have programs out there, for example, our programming which is designed to handle that, those data and transform them into something that we're used to seeing or into a, into a tabular form, columns and rows, okay, that we can work with. Now, over on page 223, um, they walk over about putting data into a new table and here they, at the bottom of page two, 223, they want you to copy all the data from the foods table to our 0607 foods table. There's that task. There's a little bit easier way to do that, okay? And he provides you some code there on 67. But I, 
have tried it before, and what I found is that it just simply did not work properly. Um, what we're going to do here is simplify this, okay? And so that I can, so that I can let you see it easily, I'm going to come down here and write the code. And here it is. This will be six seven. Now let us hope that this works. I'm gonna try this. And so I'm gonna click create, query design. It says the existing table will be deleted before you run the query, okay. That's fine. And we're gonna put in two new rows into the table and boom. Now let's go over here to the 0607 foods table and you'll see that we took the data that was in the L foods table and we've put it into this 0607 foods table. So we used a select I'll go back up here. We'll talk about what we just did. I selected from the L foods that the L the uh, L underscore foods table and notice something quite in, that we did. I put dot and then I used an asterisk, which meant get all of the fields from that table. The asterisk is a wild card. The dot says everything that's in that table. When you see like okbu.edu, the same process that we use to link web pages is essentially the same process that we use to go and link up a table with a table. They've just put it in, they've just, because we have limited storage in devices, we create pages, if you will, and it mimics that process. So we've selected everything that was in the L foods and we put that into the 0607 foods table. And so uh, we're gonna call that, we're gonna call this, we've got this done and the query here, we're gonna, we're gonna save it and we're gonna call it task six dash seven. Okay, and so we put the data into a new table. Um, and over at the top of page 224, you can see the results. I'll just open this up again so you can see it. And there you are, the supplier ID. The new item, the product code, the description. Price, the price increase. Okay. So we've gotten that done. We've 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 done uh, task six seven. Now, if I want to, um, I can go ahead and 
put in a new price for these items if I assume that the price plus the price increase is, is 25 cents. I don't know, maybe it was a buck 75 and then 25 cents and that's how we got to $2. And we probably did some type of insertion or operation, but that's what we wanna get so we're good to go. Now they show you how to, to create the employee table using Oracle. And again, the differences between Oracle SQL and Access SQL are not that great. However, I selected this textbook for a simple reason. Two reasons, actually. Number one, it shows you the differences between the code and teaches you some about the data dictionary in, in, in Oracle, that product. And in, the append, and in one of the appendices of this, of this book, they walk you through the process of installing, uh, if you wish, on your own machine, a baby form of Oracle. So you can honestly tell an employer, yeah, I've worked with Oracle. Okay, I've had some experience with it. And we'll see some of the, the graphic user interfaces from Oracle as we go along. Now, over on page 226, the authors talk about um, adding a primary key to a table, all right? And they walk you through the code to get that done using the alter table, okay? So that you have a primary key constraint. Look, as I showed you, the easiest way to do it, and this is all commercial products are like that. If you're working at a database administrator uh, level, you'll go in and you'll just, you'll have a graphic user interface. You say, what are you talking about? Well, we just did it a while ago. Let's go to the design view of this. And if I wanna make supplier ID, okay, the uh, primary key, it's simple. I click here, I can click up there, or I can click here. Voila, and I've done it. The supplier ID, okay, is the primary key. Now, I don't wanna confuse the issue. However, we can have more than one primary key in a table. If I'm really concerned about making sure that I have a certain type of product from a certain supplier, I can either do that in the query or I can make two, I can make product code, I can also make it a primary key. But we don't wanna do it because it may alter, it may create some problems for us down the road, okay? And it's quite likely that we could have two different suppliers who supply us with the same type of product, i.e. a product code. You follow me? So there's a little bit of logic there, maybe some constraints. So I just had you do the GUI and, and, and we've gotten that done here with 0607. So we've really progressed some here. And again, there at the bottom of page 228, the author walks you through the process of uh, dropping a primary key. And that's simple. If I'm in the graphic user interface, I can do this. And I take it off. If I do this, I put it on. It's that simple. Okay. And uh, he decides here, he, he said, okay, if I decided to make the menu item the primary key, it's simple. I just come down here and I make it the primary key. You know, it's whatever works for me. You can see how simple this is versus writing the code. And the reason that we have graphic user interface that is the, that is the result of what we call object-oriented programming using icons 
is to prevent the kinds of errors that can occur when we keep writing code and keep writing code. We're more likely to get things right if we respond to icons than to just keep writing code. Now here's a situation over on page two, 229 where they talk about adding a new column to a table. Okay? And the, at the top of page 230, they say they want to alter the table 0611 foods and add a column date introduced using the date time format. Okay? Well, let's go ahead and write the code. So we'll close everything here. We'll save our changes. And now we're going to come to, and this is, we could just, well, we could, we could just simply input it, but it's up here in the chapter already. We're gonna alter the table. Um, and this is gonna be over on 610 up in that area. So we'll scroll back up here to 610. Okay. And here we're gonna alter that table. And he wants us to add the column date. So we're gonna add that column date. And here it is. It's under what he, what, what he has is 611. I call it 610 number two. Let's look at up here at six number two. Method one. And let's see here. That's adding the constraints. We did that. So he doesn't do a yeah. Here we are. We're gonna alter the the uh, we're gonna alter alter the table. Um, he wants to alter that table of six hundred one ten foods. Okay. I'm looking to see that. Code there. Well, why dither around with it? Let's just write the code. Okay, it's, so it's gonna be alter table. And SEC. 0601 underscore foods. And we're going to add, and we're going to um, alter table. And it's over on page 220, excuse me. Alter table. Um, Section 0611, I do the wrong thing here. Gonna get us messed up. I'm sorry, folks, stick with me. Uh, alter table SEC 0611 underscore foods. Okay. And we're gonna add column. And it will be date 
underscore introduced. Okay. And then date time. And then we'll put in the and hopefully this will work. We're going to use the date time. There on page 230 is going to show you the beginning table. That's the this 060111 foods table. And then he's going to show you the ending table at the bottom of page 230. So we're going to alter, we're going to use the alter table. Write the alter table query. And so I'm going to click create, query design. Okay. And we're going to run it. And notice that we get the data definition goes hot because we've added a column and we define the type of data that are that's in it. Show my eraser here. So let's go take a look at that table and see what, what we have wrought to see if it looks like it's supposed to. So 601 foods. So here it is. I will open that up. And here we have the date introduced. Okay, and we can go into the design view. And there's the date introduced. That's the name of, uh, of that field. And it's in day and time. Now, I, I have everything there is is in uppercase. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to edit that field. So I'm going to make I'll put all caps lock. And then underscore introduced. So it looks like everybody else. And then I still have the date time constraint there. So I'm gonna save this table, okay? And I basically have done that task at the top of page 230. And let's see what it looks like. And there it is, the price increase. Now we don't have any dates where we've introduced it. We have everything else here, okay? And I'll put this part here. And so we're good to go. Then we would go back and populate that. I want you to notice something because when we put it into date and time, uh, data type, notice something. When I click here, look what happens. I get a little calendar where I can enter the data. This is an input mask. When we invoke that date time form of data, basically we told the, the, we told the machine, we only want it entered in a certain way. Now we can go back up if we want and change it, but We've got that done. The authors talk about expanding the length of a, of a column. Um, and they show you a, a way to do that. And this is in the section 06012 foods. Let's go in there and let's use the, the graphic user interface. So find 06012, 06, Section 0612 foods, and let's open that up. Let's go to the design view. And they basically want us to uh, make the column description, that, that description column, um, 25 characters. Okay? And let's see, on the description field, it's and it is in there as column description, variable characters, 25. 
So let's go ahead. It's, it's short text, so it's it's. Uh, let's go ahead and make it the field twenty five. And let's look for the variable character in here. I don't think we're going to find it in the drop down menu. I think by default it's just going to say it's short text. But we increased the but we increased it to a field size of twenty five. And we go up here, save it. Yes, we saved it. Okay. Now, if we want to delete a column, they talk about deleting a column from a table, and we're going to drop a column. They show us the code there in page 233 where we can alter the table. As you know, I've always said, and this is over in the uh, 0603, 060 section of 613 foods. And I don't think that's a table that we had created. There's, oh, there it is. There it is. My apologies. Here it is. This is the table, uh, section, section, section 0613 underscore foods. And they want us to drop the column price increase. So they show us the code at the top of page 233 where I used the, I altered the table. Section 0603 underscore foods, drop column price increase. Okay. I can write the code or I can use the graphic user interface. And I'm going to use the graphic user interface. And it's pretty simple. I'm going to get rid of that like this. I'm just going to delete the row. And it's deleted. And boom. And now I'll go back up here. Say this, yes. And now the column's deleted. I could have written the code to do it, or I can use the graphic user interface. I think I've harped on you uh, to you enough about wherever possible, use the GUI, that is the graphic user interface. So we've done some work with manipulating tables. The authors walk through several other things we can do to alter tables, um, add in columns, delete a column, delete a row, rename a column, change the names, uh, the data in columns, change the data type, reorder columns, delete a primary key. You can do all of that in the graphic user interface as opposed to writing all of this code that's over here on page 235. Okay, you just you could use the code to say, okay, here's what I do, and then go to the graphic user, user interface and, and change it. And here they're having us work with section 0614 uh, phone list. So let's go up here to the phone list. We can find I think that is create this table. See if I can find the table 0614 phone list. And I'm not seeing it. Okay. Oh, this is the, okay. This is the, the, we're working with the employees table. No. Okay. You're wanting us to create this table. The middle page 235. Okay. Well, we put some data into the 0614 phone list. And I'm looking for that. I don't see it. So that's a table he wanted us to create. But the bottom line is this. Um, any one of these operations that I want to do, I'm better off doing it using the graphic user interface than I am trying to write the code. Okay? But you can see that it's there and what you'll get. And they had us, they were going to have us do some work with the employees table. Yeah, we put some data from one table into the employees table. And I'm looking at the top uh, six of page 236, and that's what it would look like. 
The authors are going to spend some time starting at page 237 and 238 and 239 talking about getting rid of um, get, getting rid of duplicates, duplicate rows. And when we have duplicate rows, it gives us um, it, it, it just simply gives us anomalous data and it can create some problems for it. And the authors show us there on page 238 where we have two duplicate rows that are in truth really um, uh, a single piece of information in another table. So they show us how to do that. And let's see, we got the six no duplicate rows. 605B. So we were to have created some. No, those are there. Let's do that. And we'll just come up here and, and we'll write the code. This is going to be at the we're at the bottom of page 239. And we're gonna we're gonna type in and we're gonna use this select distinct which means no duplicates. And notice I put select distinct wildcard. I select everything, but I only want distinct records, no duplicates. And we're gonna put that into um, SEC 06. One six. I think we're we're, we're um, making a table here into SEC six one six underscore no another underscore duplicate another underscore rows. Okay, and we're gonna get that from. Section 0615B. And we're ready to roll. And let's see what happens. So we'll close all these others here. We don't need. And query one, I'm just going to call, call that uh, task six Z. Okay. And now we're ready to click create. We'll go to query design, close, and we'll do the SQL view. Boom. We'll put in the code. Pardon me. And we're going to run this drill and see what happens. We're about to paste four new rows into a table. And so we've just made a table. And that's called 0616 no duplicate rows. And there it is. There's our table with no duplicate rows. Okay. And they show us the bottom of page 239, the output. Now, he has, if you look there, Susan Brown, Martha Woods, um, the result set is just the opposite of what, of what we have. We have the same records, they're just in a different order. So we could, we could reorder them if we chose to do that. And probably these are probably what we see is by employee ID. So let's go into the, um, yeah. 
no, nah, it's not worth the time. So we've gotten that done. We've done 616. So our query, we're going to call that, we'll call that, we're going to save it as task 6-16. Okay, and we'll save that. And that's, we use the select distinct. And we got everything that was in 06015B. No duplicate rows. Now, if I want to try to improve this, Let's go into the design view if we've got one here. And we've got the first thing, the last thing. Okay, so there is no field for employee ID. So we'll go back up to the results set. Okay, and we'll close all. And The authors walk you through the process of, of distinguishing between duplicate rows if they should occur. Again, that's using the distinct. And that's one of the reasons we use primary keys is to eliminate that. And uh, there at the bottom of page 241, that we, we select data into from the 617C table into 615A, then we alter the table and we get a call a row ID counter. And then we get the object bought, the price, etc. And it shows us the beginning table at the bottom of page 241 and then the results set. So let's go down here to, uh, to 617, what he has. And the first thing is uh, into he's got that line number. So he's going to select everything. And then we select distinct. He doesn't give us the code to get that accomplished, I don't think. We select distinct. So that's not a big deal. There's not that much code. Um, but if you look at the bottom of page 241, just look at those three bottom queries and I'm gonna walk you through so you can see. Now, before we do that, look at the beginning table, which is that 0615A table, and it has the object bought and the price, okay? Now, we're going to select everything that's in, I'm looking at that very first query there, 0615A into 0617C. So we're going to take all that data in there. Then we're going to alter that table and add a column row ID counter. Then we're going to select that row ID with the object bought and the price into the line numbers from section 0615. And you end up with that order there. Okay. Now let me say this. I'm, I'm kind of lazy and I admit it. But let me tell you something, the work that you do there to, to write that code at the bottom of page 241 is unnecessary if you have, you have created a table that resembles what you have in terms of the ending table at page 242. And this is an instance where you do the kind of planning that you need to so you know that you're gonna need a table that has the row ID 
the object bought and the price. So this becomes a process where you plan things out. I'm gonna show you something here real quickly and then we'll, and then we'll call it a day. Um, don't say. Click on database tools, okay? And then click on relationships. And what you're going to see is, this is a schematic that shows me visually how these tables are all connected, okay? If you don't plan how things will be connected, and we'll talk about how we join tables, you're gonna end up with a nightmare. Unfortunately, uh, most companies start and then they just keep incrementing along. till so it comes to the point where somebody says, we need to burn this down and rebuild it. So there's a lesson there, but if you, if you, when I, when last night, when I showed you folks the, the, uh, showed all of you the, the analytic cube, and you've heard me talk about information design principles, and we've talked about tables and, and what we want in those tables, and what's, and, but it all starts with the business case. I don't have a single table in my database or warehouse. And, and I don't connect any two tables unless there's a business case for doing so. Otherwise, I'm wasting time and money, the most precious of which is time of my employees. Okay? And we'll close that design view off. So they give us some key points at the end of, of uh, chapter six about creating your own tables. I've given you what words of wisdom I've learned um, from a hard fought battle. And I just showed you the relationship um, view in the database tools showing you this whole look, apparently mishmash of spaghetti that's there with all these tables that are connected in all these different ways. But that's why we do what we call entity relationship diagrams. And that's why we, sit down and plan this stuff out and we review a database and its tables on a consistent basis to make sure that the system serves us and our customers and our stakeholders and all the people we work for because ultimately it's got to work for them. Well, folks, thank you so much. God bless you. Have a good one. And I'm going to stop the recording and then end the meeting.